the New Orleans Humanist Perspective, presented by the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association, following a few principles of humanism. We're committed to the use of science and reason for understanding the universe and for solving human problems. We're skeptical of untested claims of knowledge, but we're open to new ideas. We are concerned with securing justice and fairness in society and in ending intolerance and discrimination. We are committed to the total separation of religion and government. We affirm humanism as a realistic alternative to the theologies of despair and the ideologies of violence. We reject the concept of an afterlife and believe in living a full and rewarding life here and now. We value and respect each individual's right to judge and lead their lives according to their own position as long as it's respectful of other people living in a free society. We hope you enjoy today's program and others in the weeks to follow. Well, hello. Here we are and there you are and uh, glad to have you back with us. Uh, my guest today is Stanley Goldberg. Stan has been a member of the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association, I think as long as I have, which is more years than we're able to count. Uh, and uh, I, I want to let you know more about who Stan Goldberg is. It says here, uh, he had uh, a B.S. in chemistry in 1953 from the University of Maryland, um, a Ph.D. in organic chemistry in 1958, Indiana University, professor emeritus from 2002 till the present time, University of New Orleans. He was a professor there from 1971 to 2002, and um, a visiting professor uh, uh, in 1969 to the University of Bristol in England, associate professor in 1965 to 71 the University of South Carolina, a uh, consultant in 1965 to the National Heart Institute, and um, assistant professor of 1960 to 65 University of South Carolina, instructor and research associate in 1959-60, the University of Illinois, and a project scientist, 1957-59, for the United States Air Force. Did I cover everything, Stan? Yes. All right. Well, now, having heard all of that, we're going to hear about the origin of life. Okay? The show is yours, Stan. Well, maybe we ought to sort of start at the, big, at the question, uh, why, why be interested with how life uh, originated on Earth? And I suppose the most uh, obvious reason is that human beings are uh, curious, and this is a, a, a subject of uh, universal interest. In fact, uh, every culture since human history has their own creation story. And in, uh, in, in the West, the uh, paramount story is uh, Genesis. Uh, and to put that in perspective, I'd like to uh, read you a quote of uh, Professor Tom uh, Maudwin of New York University. And he says that the, um, the expectations following a Genesis account of creation make human beings the main purpose of the universe. Now, the Genesis uh, explanation was the Adam and Eve story, yes. right? Yes. That God created Adam whole and then created Eve as a whole female human being. And that is the, the Genesis uh, explanation of the origin of life. Is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and, and the other, the point is that uh, the, uh, the Genesis account uh, makes human beings the uh, main purpose of the universe, but the great weight of evidence is against this. We have uh, precise knowledge of the distribution of galaxies 
and know that ours is nowhere near the center of the universe. Just as we know that our planetary system has no privileged place in the billions of such systems in our galaxy, galaxy, and that Earth is not at the center of our planetary system. We also know that the Big Bang, the beginning of our universe, occurred about 13.7 billion years ago, whereas Earth didn't even exist until about 10 billion years later. So we're not talking about now about the origin of the universe. We're talking about the origin of humans. Well, we're starting. They're with connected. Sort of, They're interconnected. We'll, we'll, work, we'll work to, to okay. life. Yeah. So the point is that no one looking at the vast extent of the universe and our unprivileged position in it could seriously maintain that the whole was intentionally created for us. This realization began with Galileo, and it has only intensified since. Well, if Earth is not special, then maybe life is uh, unique. That is to say, the only place in the universe that where life exists is on Earth. When you say Earth is not special, we're just one little dot in the whole order of things. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and the origin of life on Earth has, has been a question throughout human history, and most accounts have been related to the idea of spontaneous generation, that living organisms arose from inanimate objects or even other forms of life. Uh, for example, flies from putrid matter, uh, mice from dirty hay, crocodiles from rotting logs, and so on. But slowly, over hundreds of years, this idea has been discredited, leaving up to the mid-19th century the view that microorganisms from may have accounted for life, coming spontaneously from putrefied, rotting flesh. What's a microorganism? Well, a, uh, an, an organism that has to be, uh, you need a microscope to see. Is it the smallest and, possible, or can that, even that be divided? Uh, and not, well, the smallest possible form of life is a microorganism. Micro okay, well, all Bacteria. right. You understand that I'm, I'm uneducated in this field, so I'm going to ask question. Sure, go ahead. And so uh, even, even that, uh, that, that, the remnants of that idea of spontaneous com uh, generation <clears throat> was totally discredited by experimental work, but principally by Louis Pasteur. Okay. And this was in the mid 19, uh, uh, the, uh, 19th century, 1860. So that for about 50 or 60 years, there was no hypothesis dealing with the origin of life on Earth. It's sort of embarrassing. You mean after they discredited the prior theory, they didn't have one to replace it? Not until 50 or 60 years later. Okay. And so that takes us to the uh, mid-1920s, when the Russian biochemist Eugene uh, Oparin put forth the idea that uh, maybe life could arise, maybe life arose from natural, chemical, and physical laws and properties. And that was maybe? Maybe, okay. yes, you know, just an idea. Uh, and, but this became uh, more and more popular, and the, uh, the big breakthrough, I guess, uh, was in 1952, when uh, <clears throat> a pair at the University of Chicago, Harold Urey, and his graduate student, Stanley Miller, did an experiment consisting of uh, a closed uh, glass arrangement containing uh, the gases that were presumed to be on the early Earth. 
and a source of water and a, uh, a source of energy. Simulated lightning is what they called it, which just was an electrical discharge in this mixture. Mm -hmm. And this was allowed to circulate around inside for a while, and then they analyzed what was found in the water. And there are literally hundreds of uh, compounds, many of which are necessary, we recognize necessarily for uh, present day life. And uh, this sort of let the fire, lit, lit the fire under uh, research into original life using this idea. And um, the, uh, the question is that uh, you, there's really only two ways that life could have, have come about either by natural means that just I just tried to describe or supernatural means. But in the realm of science, uh, super, supernatural events uh, have no place. It's just not admitted as evidence. So that the, uh, we could say that the new or the modern uh, spontaneous generation is this idea of operans. Okay. Uh, the uh, life arose spontaneously as a result of having the right conditions, the right materials, and, and, uh, and just through the natural reactions of uh, chemicals and laws of chemistry and physics, this it was came not, about. It was not pre-designed. Not pre-designed and not supernatural. All right. Well, uh, then this becomes a, uh, a very serious uh, scientific problem. It becomes a problem of mechanisms. What, what chemical processes could we reasonably have expected to have occurred on the early Earth and uh, that could the, uh, evolve to the uh, chemical processes that we know in the living organism. So uh, this automatically becomes a, uh, an evolution, a chemical evolution. We know about uh, Darwin's uh, light, evolution of life, uh, but it's the same idea that uh, through random accidental happenings, something is enhanced to react to its surroundings that uh, benefits a, uh, that part of the pro process which could uh, be important in, uh, in, the, uh, in a living system. Okay. So this idea of chemical evolution. So this gets very technical and I'm not going to try uh, to uh, all right. Well, you left me where inside this glass enclosure, they had some compound or something. Is that where we're? Is that where we're moving from? Uh, that was a start. That was a revelation. Okay. That, that uh, among the, the hundreds of materials formed from this experiment, that uh, many that were needed for for life were were, were formed also. And uh, these are simple molecules, but in life, uh, simple molecules are strung together to become very important. So this is the, uh, the unit, the individual units, monomers, are strung together to form polymers, which are required for any living organisms. These include proteins, carbohydrates, and the uh, material that are used in uh, replication, the uh, nucleic acids, DNA, and uh, ribonucleic acids and all. And so one of the problems is that uh, these large polymolecules are not, are not formed in these experiments that, uh, of the type that uh, Miller and Urey uh, proposed. So one of the problems, how, 
how could we reasonably expect these to form given the monomers that are formed in the manner of uh, Urey and Miller? And so this uh, really says, well, this is experimentally tested. We can uh, try things that they'll seem to be reasonable, that they could have occurred on the early Earth, and see if we can, uh, we can make these molecules. Mm -hmm. Okay. But one of the problems is, uh, and I think maybe we can do this, is a problem of symmetry. If we look at, think about uh, mirror symmetry, we know that uh, <clears throat> you can reflect some object in the mirror, and the object and the reflection are identical. They have mirror symmetry or they are not identical. In a mirror. The object and the mirror are not identical. They lack reflection symmetry. All right. Our hands, object and mirror image, All right. they're, they're different. Okay. So molecules can have this property as well. And in fact, it's very important. We recognize that it's very important in life is the basis for unique shapes, molecular shapes, that like a lock and key can fit within each other and carry out the processes uh, that are required for life. But in the, uh, in the simulation experiments, the, like the Uri Miller, Miller one, the, um, the small molecules that are needed to make the large ones are themselves lacking in mirror symmetry. So there's two of them the object and the mirror image. But we know in life that only one exists. But in the origin of life, if both of them are formed, then we have a, a problem. How do you get to one? Because these molecules, even though they differ because of their lack of symmetry, have the same properties, chemical and physical properties. So there's no basis, no way to get them apart. And so this is, the, uh, this is a major problem in the study of the origin of life. And it turns out, Harry, that uh, out on beyond the solar system, there are vast clouds of dust. And this, uh, one of the th things that these dust clouds do is they coagulate and make uh, the material that makes uh, meteorites, meteors, and comets. And, uh, and, and many of these things are delivered around the universe, the Earth, and, and all. Uh, but also on these dust clouds are chemical reactions that take place, probably by the same means of the Uri Miller experiment, but only now way out in space. And these compounds that we find in the Uri Miller experiments are on, on the dust, part of the dust clouds, which contribute to the comets and meteors, which some of which are um, delivered to Earth and have been since its inception. Yes. Well, the uh, molecules that lack the refraction symmetry that are necessary for life are part of this mixture. But about uh, 20 or 30 years ago, some of the materials in a certain class of meteorite, which we don't have to worry about, nomenclature and all, uh, were investigated and uh, investigated and examined uh, for their uh, composition of these object and mirror image. Now, when they're formed, they're formed on Earth in the Uri Miller experiment, they're formed in equal amounts. But it turns out in the meteorite, there's an unequal amount of them. So the symmetry is broken in that sense, and it solves or provides the basis of a solution for for this problem, how do we get to one 
of one, either the object or the mirror image, because throughout all life, only one exists and functions. And it's the same one. It's not, it's not you know, when we find in, in you, you might have this, and in me, I might have mm -hmm. that, but it's the same one in all life. And this is a very important consideration, because if you're going to use these monomers, say, amino acids to make proteins, the origin of life, and if you had both object and non-superimposable mirror image present, and you made a modest protein just with at random, say only 25 units, then how many different combinations are there? Well, it's a huge number. It's two to the 25th power, which turns out to be 33 million 554,432 separate polymers, 25 units long, in uh, polyamino acids, but only one of which is going to operate in, li in a living system. So this is an impossible uh, situation. Nothing could be expected to, uh, to give ri rise to, to, to participate in uh, in a living reaction to evolve onto a living system with that kind of mixture and number. And remember, this is 25 units in this uh, protein is very small. And then, then you see how fast the numbers go up. But you are going to be able to separate the real one from the mirror image. Yeah. Okay. And I, the, I don't I want mean, you to the, run out of time. Yeah, well, the, the, uh, the key is that it... Uh, <clears throat> they're delivered to the early Earth, and uh, by mechanisms that we can investigate, uh, we can separate, in other words, concentrate one almost to the exclusion of the other. Okay. And, uh, and so that's the kind of work I've been doing and been interested in. Okay. But there are many, many aspects of this research. Okay. And there are two or three worldwide journals that have published this research. There are hundreds of laboratories that are investigating it and all. And the, uh, this is also a, uh, a, 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 the same part of the question, you know, who are we? And the, uh, the presence of, uh, of life on uh, extraterrestrial outside of the Earth would be a very important discovery and there's m much effort to try and uh, to find this and all. In fact, uh, so you can say this is the golden age of uh, cosmology, the study of the universe. We're finding, uh, astronomers are finding hundreds of, uh, of planets, so-called habit uh, habitable planets, that have the conditions close enough to their sun or not far enough away of temperature and perhaps water that could be hospitable uh, to the formation of life. And so you see, I think of this as just another uh, stage in this uh, question of are we, who are we? Are we at the center of the universe? Our Earth isn't, but maybe life is. But if life is found in other in extraterrestrial uh, locations, or we can understand how it came about, the mechanisms on Earth, then it seems to me that question's answered. You know, we're, there's nothing special here, about us either. If it yeah. can happen here, it could happen in other exactly in other planets. And we have to revise. All right. So you're saying it happened here. What is it that happened? What is it? What <laughs> happened? Life. In other words, when you found that which one was which one was real, then what happened to that? Thing in oh, that then, drop of water. then that opens up the possibility that the uh, combination of these units, by methods that you can simulate in the laboratory, combination of these units could could have taken place, and life could have be, uh, come about originated. Right, now this I'm way. looking at something that uh, also I think came from you or from the uh, Scientific American, which says. Uh, uh, within one billion, ye one billion years after the formation of the Earth, 4.6 billion years ago, one-celled organisms had evolved 
out of organic molecules produced non-biologically by an atmosphere containing no free oxygen. So that little thing you were describing in that experiment is uh, told you how these this molecule, an organic molecule, occurred. Am I reading this correctly? Yes. Uh, All right. So that or then what happened to that organic molecule? <laughs> well, those organic molecules that are formed uh, by these random methods, but natural methods, uh, some of them are needed. Uh, uh, as components of life as we recognize it. And okay. so the question is how, how do they get to form these uh, chemical systems that we call living? Okay, we got about five minutes to go. So you tell us how we came from that molecule to you and, you and me sitting here. I can't. <laughs> But I can tell you the idea behind it, and the rest of it depends on uh, discovering uh, reasonable, probable ways in which it happened. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. All, you got you got two minutes to tell me that. <laughs> but, they're, but they're all uh, uh, non uh, non supernatural. Of course. Yes. Of course. So these are, these are ways that we uh, understand. And it's just a matter of finding how, which ones combine okay. to do so this. So a single cell organism then somehow or other divided or something became more than one cell. Is that, uh, is that what, what you envision? Well, that, that's the, uh, after, after they're formed and going on to multiple cells, that's yeah. life evolution. Okay. But what I'm trying to put across is that this same idea occurs could have occurred with uh, chemical evolution, chemical processes that gives rise to a living system. All right. And what you're also trying to emphasize is that if, if, if that is the way it happened here on Earth, it could have happened and could be happening all over the universe, right? Many places, yes, exactly. Okay, and so our search for extraterrestrial life uh, is not totally in vain, except that we don't have the capacity to find it. Would you agree with that? Yes. All right. What else would you like our audience to hear as long as you got a minute to go? <clears throat> well, <laughs> the... Uh the idea that uh, that life is uh, not not strange, not uh, uh, mysterious, okay. you know, is, uh, it is, is is part of this it, background it can as be well. Explained. Yeah. Stan, thank you for being here. Thank you, folks, for watching our show. I hope you'll be with us again.